Thank you for joining me this evening for this Holy Thursday, Monday Thursday service. Let us join together and say our welcome and gathering prayer. Gracious God, your anointed one, on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood. Mercifully grant that we may receive it thankfully in remembrance of Jesus Christ our Lord, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life. Amen. Our opening hymn this evening is Let Us Break Bread Together on Our Knees on page 618. We'll sing verses 1 through 3. Thank you. 
It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. May them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, both now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a share in the blood of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. The meal has been prepared. Let the people of God come.
eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. lesson comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verses 1 through 14, the first Passover instituted. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If the household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Our gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 1 to 18. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know what I am doing now, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet he had, and had put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. 
I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But it is to fulfill the scripture. The one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. Tonight we come together on this Maundy Thursday. Have you ever wondered what the word Maundy means? It's Latin, and it means commandment. So this is Commandment Thursday. This commandment shared by Jesus after he washes the disciples' feet had to do with love that is embodied and seen in service. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. It might seem unreasonable to command love, but that is what Jesus does. When Jesus says, as I have loved you, he is pointing back to the washing of the disciples' feet. But he's also pointing back to each and every interaction and event that he had shared with them and with others. As I have loved you, and you, and you, and you. We interpret his actions of healing and forgiveness as love. As I have loved you in these ways. We interpret his actions done in humility and compassion. And we understand he is directing us to do the same, to live in love, to serve in love, as I have loved you. With agape love, with the love of God that includes humility and compassion and empathy and, of course, grace. Likewise, the meal we remember is not just a ritual or a reenactment, it is also a loving act of service. We let the bread and the cup be a reminder that fuels us to service that will continue once the worship service has ended. And we are reminded this time of intimacy over a meal between Jesus and his disciples. We too are welcomed into that intimacy and relationship with Jesus each time we gather to partake of the bread and the cup. We let the healing and the feeding of our soul go deeper than the surface and last longer than the moment of serving or the moment of consuming the elements. We make a commitment to love and to obedience we respond to the commandment to live in love in a new way, to love in the Maundy words of Jesus, as I have loved you. We can't help but wonder what was going through Jesus' mind when he got up to grab the towel and the basin that night. We could consider him thinking, well, maybe if I show them what I mean, they'll finally get it. Or perhaps he simply saw a need, dirty feet, and got up to meet the need. We can't help but wonder what was the look on the faces of the disciples as Jesus prepares to do this task. Is it shock, surprise, disbelief, or was anyone even looking to see what Jesus was preparing to do? Foot washing was done by servants. And in the minds of the disciples, there was something demeaning about kneeling to serve in such a humble way. But for Jesus, it wasn't demeaning. It was an opportunity to love and serve them. And on this night, to teach them love and service. What makes it great is that it's done during the time of intimacy as he gathers them together on this last night, sharing a meal. All the teaching about what he had done would be explained later. You know what that means, don't you? That means that there was some time for them to feel awkward, 
time to question in their minds what had just happened. We know Peter voiced his objection, but what about the others? Did they just let it happen? Did it cause some awkwardness, not only between Jesus and each disciple, but between the disciples as well? Did it humble them? When Jesus asked them, do you know what I have done for you? No one responded. They didn't know. We can picture them like children looking down at their plates, thinking, I don't know, do you? Let's wait. Peter will say something. Even if he doesn't know, he'll say something. But Peter had already spoken out. We've seen this reaction from the disciples before. Their silence pointing to the lack of understanding. Jesus would teach through parable and then explain the parable because they didn't understand. Was this another one of those times? Or once the foot washing moments had passed, did their thoughts return of the bickering that they were doing about who would be prominent and hold positions in the kingdom of God? Were their minds filled with thoughts of being rewarded in the kingdom for their loyalty and devotion to Jesus, be it in heaven or on earth? A bit selfish, don't you think? They didn't understand the significance of what Jesus had done on this night, which means they truly didn't know him as a servant king. As Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment, we might think, why is this new? Jesus had said, love one another before. The new commandment, he says, is love one another as I have loved you. It wasn't new. He had already acted it out in front of them each and every day for three years. As I have loved you. He had already expected that from them as his followers, they should follow his example. This time by serving them, Jesus gets on his knees, bending to a task that even fishermen thought was beneath them. Love as I have loved you. Is this what we're doing for Jesus today? Okay. Are we willing to get down on our knees to serve another? Are we loving in the name of Jesus only in word by saying, I'll pray for you, but not necessarily meeting a need? Are we avoiding the down and the dirty, the outcast and the socially awkward? Are we willing to love as he loved us? Loving in the ways of Jesus means our acts of love and service must be unconditional, full, and complete. Loving as he loved must be done with all the characteristics and behaviors of Christ, always seeking to reveal Jesus to others as we live generous lives filled with grace-filled acts of mercy. Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. Are we doing that? Washing feet wasn't meant to be a ritual. It was meant to be an act of love and service that was essential and was needed to be done. And it was also a lesson in a way to live. It is in the willingness to serve and the follow through of serving that is the command, the mandi. Whether it's on Thursday, or Friday, or Monday, or any other day of the week, that's the risk of service. You never know when you will be called to serve, to put your love into action with more than words. We remember that Maundy, the commandment to love as we have been loved, is seen all throughout Jesus' ministry. And it's reiterated for us all throughout the New Testament scriptures with regards to our discipleship. Perhaps it would have been 
easier if Jesus had just said, remember to love one another. But then he adds, as I have loved you, and we sigh, and we fuss, and we say we can't do it because it's too hard. And, and we're not Jesus, right? Loving like Jesus separates us and challenges us. Yeah, it does. Isn't that why we sing, they will know we are Christians by our love? It also raises the level of our commitment as a follower of Jesus. It requires us to learn from Jesus and apply his ways to be our ways. Jesus' love for us was unconditional, sacrificial, full, and complete. It was devotion at its deepest level as he would give his life for us. Jesus' love for us was filled with all the aspects of the characteristics of God. God the Father. That's who he was showing us, the Father. Generous, patient, compassionate, and forgiving. All these things found in the washing of the disciples' feet. Whether they realized it or not, he was loving them. Pulling out all the stops one last time. As we read the stories of his life and ministry, we learn how to love. In love, Jesus did not judge the woman caught in adultery, but challenged those who were sinless to cast the first stone. When the woman in the crowd touched the hem of his robe and was healed by her bleeding disorder, Jesus took the time to address her in love. In a brief encounter at a well, Jesus transformed the life of a woman who helped to spread the news of the Messiah to her village. In love, he dealt with the impetuous Peter, who was outspoken at every turn. And in love, he helped Thomas overcome his doubts. In love, he carried the cross for you and for me, loving all of us yet to be born to the moment of his own death for the forgiveness of our sins. This is the love that we are called to have for each other. Can we live in love as we are commanded by Jesus? Tonight, on this blessed Monday, Thursday, this is our challenge. This is our calling. This is our commandment. And it is found in the example of the awesome grace in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Most holy God of mercy and grace, as we gather tonight in remembrance of Jesus' selfless act of foot washing at the meal with the disciples, we find ourselves considering the tension between being religiously somber and joyfully humbled. As we remember the meal itself through our communion liturgy, we are humbled at your invitation that you would welcome us. It is a mystery almost too great to ponder that you, the King of creation, would send to us your Son to undergo humiliation and death, all to make it possible for us to experience life, to experience holy relationship and ultimately eternal life with you, Father, Son, and Spirit. We are mindful of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the globe who are joining in fellowship today, celebrating within the context of risk and oppression. We pray for their protection as they live courageously as your disciples. May your name be glorified by every nation, race, and community in every place separated and called to be sacred. May all that we do remind us of your great love and sacrifice for us. And may all be done bringing you honor and glory and majesty now and forever. 
In the name of Jesus, the servant Christ, we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this evening is page 432, Yezu, Yezu. We'll sing verses 1 through 4.